I'm Danielle, which you know, because you've seen me all morning. I promise after this presentation, I will go away at some point. Um, but this is my talk that's uh, 10 tips for Drupal content authors. So who am I? My name is Danielle. Um, I am a content strategist at Cold Front Labs. Uh, before I was a content strategist, though, I was actually a high school English teacher for seven years. Um, and after I had my daughter, I wanted a career that was a little more life-work balance. <laughs> so I found my way into content strategy, and I've been doing it now at Coldfront for about two years. It's a really interesting field, and admittedly one I didn't know existed um, until I started to get involved at Coldfront. Uh, and it's a really exciting field because it's a place where words matter, and I think that's the reason I got into English teaching is because I think that words matter, and we can apply that over to the web. Um, the other thing I like to mention is I am not a developer. I don't write code. Um, I'm going to demo some stuff for you in the Drupal UI today, and I'm really scared, um, but I'm getting better and better. So I tell you that because I want you to know I often come in from the client perspective. Um, I'm somebody who was really uncomfortable with the technology and has had to figure out how to be comfortable with the technology. So I empathize with those of you who are struggling with Drupal. Um, content strategists are also notoriously touchy-feely empathetic people, um, and you're going to get that through my presentation, so be ready for it. Um, you may remember me from, <laughs> if anybody attended uh, Drupal North last year when it was in Ottawa, I did a talk about uh, scoping your website, how to talk to developers, because there's often a breakdown of communication between non-technical people and technical individuals. So that's up on YouTube. I also presented at Drupal Camp Montreal this year, making a case for digital minimalism, um, and uh, how to do content audits using Drupal as well as spreadsheets, because that's actually the best way to do a content audit. And this morning, as your friendly Drupal Camp organizer coordinator. So things I am nervous about. Remember I told you content strategists are notoriously touchy-feely people? I like to put these things out here at the beginning of the presentation because I think they set the tone. So things I'm worried about, talking too fast. I just need to accept this will happen. Uh, it's how I am. It's how I've done presentations and taught for years and years. I'll try to slow down. You can give me one of these. I know you won't be booing me. It's just like, slow down a little for me. Um, but it's going to happen. To demoing in front of you, as I mentioned, I'm going to actually get into the UI today of Drupal. Um, and additionally, this like in-between screen thing is going to mess me up. So just bear with me while I trip over my metaphorical feet. Additionally, my three-year-old is running a fever at home right now. She's with her dad. But uh, that's also on my mind if I get a little jittery. But on to a positive note, things I'm really excited about are today. This has been uh, six months in the making. And it's finally happening. Um, and in a previous life before teaching, I used to be an event planner. So it's just it's a nice little high to uh, be here and organizing this for you. Additionally, content strategy. When I was in university, I don't like in the early 2000s. If somebody had said I'm a content strategist, they would have said you're making that up. I feel like it's this very new field. Um, I think one of those breakthrough articles. If you ever Google, there's a, a list apart article called "The Web Is Content" by Christina Halverson. She's the, the guru behind Brain Traffic, which is like the content strategy agency. Uh, this field is very young. And there's so much exciting things going on in it, and I'm just really happy to be a part of it. And additionally, the Drupal Camp Auto After Party, which is at the Royal Oak on Laurier, where you can join us after the conference. Um, so who is this session for? I started this session asking you all why you were here, where you're coming from. This is the persona of person I have in mind for this presentation. If that's not you, that's OK. I think you can still get something out of it, but this is who I'm going for. So you probably work for a large pu uh, public sector organization and you manage content on a website and Drupal was thrust upon you. You likely had nothing to do with this decision. You got here and they said, here's this thing you need to learn. Deal. Um, ask questions if you want. We'll get you some training if you want, if you're lucky. And that's sort of it. So I'm here to help you through those little bumps. So you're a technically adept person but you're a little more comfortable in Microsoft Word and the general suite than, uh, let's say, in web development. So I'm talking to you guys today, mostly. You deserve an easy content editing experience. Now, that being said, what today's talk is not going to be is about configuring Drupal's UI, OK? Because I'm not a developer. I'm not a site builder. Um, my advice to you is if you want some configurations done in your user interface, talk to your development team or talk to your manager to talk to a development team about this configuration, because what I often see with clients is that you have content authors doing the grunt work who are, just don't get to communicate their needs to upper level management. So I'm telling you to be a squeaky wheel. 
I'm telling you to go in and say, this isn't working for me when I'm updating the website. And have, have your say, because often there's really little small changes that can be done with somebody who has administrative rights over the site. So the other thing I will mention is if you happen to be in this room and you are a developer or a project manager or somewhere a little more technical, um, I'm hoping you can use this presentation as a resource for your clients, but you're probably going to be pretty bored for the next 30 minutes. Just want to warn you. <laughs> Tip number one, acceptance. Um, if there's actually five stages of grief all the way to get here, but you are where you are. The odds of you walking in and telling your organization, I want a new content management system. I'm awesome at WordPress. That's what I did at my last job. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, and what I can also assure you is that if your organization is chosen Drupal, there's a functionality requirement that it meets. So no, it doesn't have the friendliest content offering experience, but if you can get over that learning curve, you're going to be able to harness these extremely amazing functionalities that only Drupal can offer. There's a really great article. You don't need to read this. This is more of a picture than something you actually need to read. But there's a really great article you can go and find, and it's called If Gmail Were Built With Drupal. Um, and it's this really great article that just sort of breaks down how if you were to make the Gmail interface so for composing a message with a Drupal web form, how long it would be and how difficult it would be to navigate as someone creating an email. Um, the Drupal community is aware of this. Uh, UX and UI have been issues that are being championed right now. So there's actually uh, a group right now called the... Admin UI and JavaScript Modernization Project, who is looking into this. And uh, Suzanne from Evolving Web, she's actually doing our closing remarks today. She is a part of that team. So if you have some really strong opinions about your experience as a content author, you have a direct source here at, the, at this conference that you can go and talk to. And she's actually looking for people to be part of a user study. So if you want to have your say, you can. And that's the great thing about the Drupal community and the open source community is that everybody has a voice. So you are where you are. Uh, and it will only get better. That's my first tip. Second, the internet is not paper. This took me a really long time to wrap my head around um, when I started working in web development. That's a strange thing to say. Um, when I started working at Coldfront. Um, because I used to be that friend that you could come to to like throw together like a Weebly site or a Wix site or like a Google site. Um, this will be slightly embarrassing, but... <laughs> Here is my, like, uh, I'm going to have a baby website um, that I put together way, way back when. And for somebody who has just enough that knowledge, we're really dangerous. Because we think about the web in terms of pages, as static pages. We say, okay, I'm going to have an about me page, and I want a picture over here, and I want to title this over here. And when we have these tools like Weebly and Wix that are super usually friendly, we get really frustrated with Drupal because we're like, I just want to do this simple thing that this other technology can do. Why can't this work? And it's because we're thinking about pages in a static way. So now I have to get back out of here. Now, clearly, if we look at the New York Times website, okay, I'd never looked at a web page like this before, but this isn't page, nor is it static, it's dynamic and it's responsive, meaning that we have all of these containers that content is put into and pulled into from different sources. I know some of you are in this room going, well, yeah, duh, okay? But this was a revelation for me, and it's a revelation I've had on the phone with clients when I'm trying to get them comfortable with the system. So nobody went in and built this page in terms of the content like nobody went in and typed into that box that box is being pulled from a completely other lo different location so for you to understand or getting your clients to understand that we can no longer think about the web in terms of static pages is i think just an important thing for content authors to know and it takes takes people time to get there because a lot of the people in this room work in web you're like yes i know this but i i've been one, it took me a really long time to learn, and two, I've seen a lot of clients struggle with it. So just having that frame of mind, getting people to understand what a dynamic page is versus a static page is, I think can really go a long way. So with that in mind, with those responsive boxes, um, not responsive, dynamic boxes, you really have to, when you're building a dynamic web website, especially with Drupal, get to know your content types. Uh, as content authors, we kind of want that Microsoft Word experience, and you're not going to get it. So learning to be comfortable with what you do have is important. So 
Here's the nerve-wracking moment we've all been waiting for. No, go back. I guess we're just going to copy and paste. All right, then. So uh, our lovely CTO over at Coldfront, Dave, set me up with this uh, yesterday, which is just this lovely little demo environment that I did not make. It's beautiful, though. Um, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about content types. So. Uh, I was working with a client recently, and they have one content type that is just sort of your title, a big open text box, big big WYSIWYG editor, and then some tags at the bottom. Um, and they had met this as, as a requirement, of course, it's a basic page. But as I was speaking with the client and figuring out what they wanted to do in that giant WYSIWYG editor, all of a sudden we realized, okay, you need some very specific content types with some very specific fields, because you shouldn't be doing too much layout and design in your WYSIWYG editor uh, because it's dangerous from a design perspective. So if I go, sorry, this is hard to see. I'm going to go to the article. Actually, let's start with recipe. Is that recipe? Yes? That's Perfect. So by having all of these fields <laughs> present here, we're able to put input information in specific areas so that it renders perfectly in the site. And it's going to be different for every single uh, type of page that we see. So if I go over to an incognito page right here, we have the way that it's going to look on a, on a uh, mobile device versus on a desktop are obviously going to be different. And if you're thinking about the internet as paper, as these static pages, you can get really fixated on, well, I want this picture here, and I want these words down here. As a content author, that is not your job. And letting go of that is really important because your designer and the way that the wireframing is laid out is going to take care of that. So let's go back over to, I can't see anything. I told you I was nervous for this part. bring you back. Help. Give okay, I go one more. I just can't get back to my slides. Sad face. <coughs> Thank you for your patience. I have closed them. Lots of fun. Let's bring them on back over. Okay, and we're back. Let's just do this the old-fashioned way. So we're just going to keep them like that. So the idea here is you need to, as a content author, get comfortable with the way that your site functions. Rather than fighting against the grain, get to know your content types and the wireframes for both your desktop site as well as all, as well as all your different mobile sites, as well as your iPad and any other uh, devices that have these big configured. You need to let go of layout and design. That's up to the wireframing and the designer of the site. And if it's really not working for you, potentially you need to talk to your development team about having a new content type or having a new landing page configured with some blocks or something. So my next tip, enough with the PDFs. Okay? We all, you know, PDFs in the 90s, they were this revolutionary moment for, for electronic files and we celebrated and we embraced them and we loved them. They are the eight track of the internet, okay? They need to go away. And the reason being, <laughs> um, web first, print second. As much as this pains me as like a paper lover, I'm the only person in my office with highlighters and sticky tabs and paper and pens. Everyone else is super digital. I love paper. But the reality is moving forward, it's web first, print second. And if you're 
uh, organization is not functioning in this manner, you need to start championing them to do so. So when it comes to PDFs, there's multiple issues. Um, talking, reaching from Tiff's keynote, yes? Was the red button push? Because I would like to have that. It's right, it's on. You okay. can play it back I to them. I that quote just a few people There you go. <laughs> web first, print second. We can chant it. Web first, print <laughs> second. Web <laughs> first, print <laughs> second. <laughs> so, AODA issues. There's issues with screen readers and there's no opportunity for alt text. And somebody's going to raise their hand and be like, Adobe has released a lot of accessibility tools and options. Nobody uses them. <laughs> Nobody's going to take four hours to build a PDF. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. You're going to make it at Microsoft Word, you're going to export it as a PDF, and then you're going to post it on the internet, and it's going to be painful, okay? Please don't. The additional is, is if you even can't get behind the accessibility stuff, which you should be able to, but if you can't, there's some user experience issues with PDFs. They're not mobile friendly. Nobody can read a PDF. I don't care if you have the extra large whatever Max phone. Okay? A PDF doesn't render well to experience. You've got to pinch and zoom and it's, it's awful. Um, and also users can't engage immediately. Maybe you should be using a web form instead. And this also has a negative impact on your search engine optimization because Google is not actually going to go in and crawl the keywords that are in there. So for all these reasons, we need these things to die. Um, so the takeaways here are that content should never be only in a PDF. Uh, a PDF can accompany content, but it is always secondary. And you always have to ask yourself, how can I get this content into the website? Sometimes it's as simple as highlighting everything in the PDF, dumping it into the WYSIWYG editor, and adding some headers. Sometimes it's not that easy. Um, but I've had moments like that with clients where they're attaching a PDF, and I'm like, can we just put this on the site? That'd be great. Um, if somebody was asking me for a use case where a PDF would be an acceptable thing on the internet. If you have content that's on a page and you did want this like stylized document that was a printable that somebody might hang on their fridge, for example, that's a great place to attach a PDF. But the information that resides in that PDF should not only reside in that PDF. It has to be replicated on the web page, which is why it comes second. All right. Headings are your friend. I'm going to uh, put a disclaimer on this that I might start saying headers, but I always need headings. It's just, it's a thing that happens in my brain. Um, headings, I didn't know were important until I started working at InWeb because most of us, when we think about creating content and, and writing the written word, we're used to the Microsoft Word suite and we're used to all of our buttons, right? We want to bold things and we want to make fonts larger and bigger and we want colors and different fonts. As a content author, you don't get to do that, okay? Your job is to just deal with the black and white content. Um, and headers actually become really important because they'll lead into some accessibility stuff that I'm gonna go through in a little bit. I recommend just this many buttons, and this is a little bit for the developers and the site builders in the room. If you're a content author and you've been given the gamut of buttons up there, you have been set up for trouble. Okay. Um, people should be taking buttons away from you so that you are being led towards success. There's issues. When we use underlines, you'll notice there's no underline button there. Because when we underline random words, users might mistake them for hyperlinks. Um, alignment is another big one. I know when I started writing stuff, I was like, why can't I center things? They're like, that's not your job. Your job <laughs> is to input the header. The CSS of the site will center it on the page where it belongs. Let it go, content author. This isn't your job. So. Working within that framework is, is going to help you to just understand that you should have just the words and not the layout for them. So when we go into these headings that you have here, um, these headings are also going to help with accessibility because all of our heading options are used by screen readers to navigate the site. Um, so don't start bolding things, although you do have a bold button. Use your headers to divide your content and it's going to play nice with your site as well as with accessibility concerns which is all kind of here that I've already said. Ooh, the last one, structure. Um, writing for the web, we don't like big blocks of text. We like white space, we like content to, to be broken up so we can scroll. Because God knows, anytime you read something on the internet, you don't actually read all of it. You skim it. You, like, the amount of time that you sit down and read a full article, especially when you're on a mobile device, is next to nothing. So you need to give your user and your content consumer headers so they can go to the parts of the article that they're interested in and the AODA and style things that I mentioned before. Okay, this is gonna be demoing again, so bear with me while I go through between my tabs. 
The block button, tip number five, is your BFF. I'll show you where it is. And the cursor lies, or at least in the demo site that I have, it does, and it used to drive me nuts. So I'm going to show you how that works. So first of all, my favorite button in the entire Drupal uh, fun author experience is this guy right here. He's like this little dash box, little box beside him, and a little box under him. He is the block button, um, and he can just make the content editing experience for somebody who doesn't know the web very well, a lot less painful. So, here's what I'm going to try. Dun, 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 dun. Let me go in here. Where's my headings for the win? Oh, cool. I was messing around with stuff. <laughs> So, I'm a content author, I'm in here. Oh, this is gonna be rough to do from over here, but that's okay. Um, I'm going through and I, I need to add some headers. So I have my, my top header that's been there and I have a, a H3 that's been done here. But hey, I want AOD all, all the way to also be a one. So I highlight it. And then this happens. Gah! Okay. The cursor lies. I have only highlighted this, but all of a sudden my normal text below it is turning to header three, and I don't know why, and I get angry, and I start highlighting other things, and it all gets really messy, and it just, I get upset. But then, if I turn on the magic of the block button, it tells me what's going on, and I can say, okay, well, this area has been marked as HD, which I kind of knew visually, okay. but what this button actually helped me understand is that the cursor in the CK editor, for whatever reason, you need to click at the beginning. I know this is a, this is like a stupid tip that I think is fantastic. So <laughs> if I had highlighted, watch, if I highlight this way, dun, 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 everything's okay. Okay, um, this was just really frustrating me and I couldn't figure this out until somebody introduced me to the block button. So the block button is gonna give me as a content author, let me know what tags are applying where, and this can also help you with lists and numbering and just seeing that, that formatting is right because we've all had that moment where we have uh, typed something up and we hit the save and we have our draft that we look at and we're like, the text is messed up. Something has gotten out of the CSS formatting and these boxes will help you distinguish where they are. Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, do you recommend just, uh, so I'm a developer, I guess, put yeah. it on by default? I think so, because it's not going to get a content author in trouble, right? The block button, it's not going to make them do something that's not accessibility friendly. It's just going to give them information. And it's kind of like giving them a little peek into the source code, which I'm going to talk about later, um, but without sending them to the source code. So it's just like this nice UX experience that makes the WYSIWYG a little bit easier to navigate. So my, my answer would be yes, um, but that's just my opinion as a content author. Good? All right. How am I doing for time? Oh, good. Okay. Now, the magic. Yay, I'm back. Okay. So, here's where my tips go a little bit off the rails. This is one you don't actually have the power to do, but you have the power to be a squeaky wheel. Okay? And this is that you can request a content health dashboard. So, this is something you won't be able to do unless you're an administrator of the site. If you are an administrator of the site and you can go in and configure things, then you can do this. And I'm gonna to attempt to do this in front of you today, uh, which I find terrifying, but I'm gonna try. So the idea being is you can create a page that has views from Drupal rendering with certain criteria so that you can watch for rotting content. Does anybody know what rot stands for in content Redundant strategy? Redundant, or trivial. Thank you. Redundant, <laughs> out of date, or trivial, okay? So you should always be looking at the content on your site to determine what is rotting, um, redundant, out of date, trivial. There's some people, and in some projects, I like to use ouch, out of date, unnecessary. Crappy. No. <laughs> <laughs> out of date. Oh, I'm too tired. Out of date, unnecessary, current. This is good. And have to write. Okay. So that if you're kind of doing more something that's more of a migration. Um, you can use that. And that actually comes from Gather Content. They do a whole blog on the OUCH acronym if you're looking for some more information on that. Um, but this is a really easy way for you as a content author to keep track of what's going on on the site. So the way that this works in my scary experience. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, guys, I'm going to configure a view in front of you. And you're all going to cheer if I pull it off. So. You're going to go over to structure. 
Or are you going to go over views? Or are you going to go over to the person's desk who has administrator rights and be like, yo, dude, here's what you're going to do for me. <laughs> so you're going to go over to views. Oh, I forgot to delete it. All right, well, we're just going to make another one that's the same. So you're going to add a view. Man, can I move this computer somewhere so I can see what I'm doing? Let's try this. Okay. So, I let's say as a content author for my food, my food recipe site, Umami, um, Umami, whatever it is, is that weird flavor profile that only part of our tongue can taste. Anyways, I'm going to decide that I, as a content author and a content moderator, want to make sure that I'm looking at any articles that our organization has written in the past year. Odds are, if these articles are more than one year old, there might be a web link in them or some content that's out of date that I should either go and change or I should archive this article. So I'm going to call this articles older than one year. Perfect. So view settings, it is going to be for a piece of content. The type of content is an article because that's one of my content types. There's no specific tags that are going to be associated with it. And I'm going to make a page that's dedicated specifically to articles that are older than one year. Um, and I'm potentially going to set this up so that you know, it's not public facing. I'm not going to do that in front of you because I don't know how, but somebody can show you. Um, but if nothing else, the web link will be there and it won't be in your site structure and you can go and look at it. So I think we're good. Dave, am I good? OK, cool. Um, so now that we are in here, um, we're going to put some criteria on this view. So we're pulling in certain pieces of content with certain criteria. So we already know that we want to look at things that are published, only things that are articles, and now we want to add that criteria about that article being a year old. So based on the way that this site is set up, it's going to be the authored on date. I'm going to add and configure this filter criteria, and I want something that is less than minus one year. And I'm going to change it to an offset. You apply. Now, I'm going to show you what it looks like, but it's not done yet, and I'll show you why. But for now, just say you were messing around with things, and you're like, okay, how's it going? <coughs> oh. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a giant picture of things. That's fun. All right. Mm. I'm sure there's somewhere else I should be clicking, but let's just roll with this. Oh no. I need the whole thing. Trying to have one of those Obama moments where you just all revel in my silence. <laughs> okay, so I have articles that are older one year, but it's not exactly laying out the way I want them to. This isn't really helpful to me as a content moderator. So I'm going to go back in, and I'm going to say that I want it to be a table, which is... Dave, feel free to shout at me. At okay, anything. in show, under format. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you want a fields. I want fields. Thanks, Dave. Dave's I'm my proud. boss. <coughs> I'm proud of you. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing things that scare me. I'm out of my comfort zone. Um, and then from here, so I've got that criteria. And I also, for the fields, right now I'm only going to have a title. Odds are, as a person I want to know the authored on. So with adding it here is just going to make sure that in the table I have it as a reference point. So. Excellent. Now let's see what it looks like. It's still not going to be right, but it'll be better. I'm going to hit save. Cool. So now I have all my articles and dates are published on, and these are things I should go and look at. Um, yesterday when I was doing it, it was giving me a whole bunch of extra results. I don't know why it's not today. But if you were to ever get into here and you see that, like, skip the spirits with delicious mocktails is populating a whole bunch of times, it can sometimes be that it's just meeting multiple filter criteria and then showing up. And then you can always go into advanced and query settings and mark it as distinct. Not necessary this time. Perplexing why, but. And that's how you configure a view.
so that you can see routing content. So either you can do this, or you can go over to the person's desk with admin rights and ask them to do it. And it's a simple little way to keep an eye on things. All right, let's keep rolling along. What are we at? Number eight, tag your stuff. Um, tagging is really valuable when done appropriately. Uh, there is some value in having open tags. But for example, there was a client we were just working with, and one of their writing topics were about the Great Lakes. Okay? So some people were tagging Great Lakes, one word. Some people were tagging Great Hyphen Lake. Some people were tagging Great Space Lakes. Um, and that can cause a lot of confusion. So if you can actually just take the time to work with your team, either to just informally set up the, your keywording for all of your articles, or if you actually want to go in and build the taxonomy in Drupal with vocabularies, that's really going to give you uh, a really powerful way of organizing your content that you're going to be able to then go to your development team or whoever configures your site and say, hey, I want to have a view over here in the corner of this page that's going to only draw on articles about the Great Lakes. And then you have that power available to you. So just consider the power of taxonomy. And the other thing is tagging is also going to help with your search engine optimization. Um, and you're going to be able to harness views. So I just, I want, didn't, this could be a whole presentation in and of itself, but I just wanted to plant in your head that we often let tags go or we just let them be open. Have a little team meeting and say, hey, let's pick five keywords for all of our articles. That's it. It doesn't have to be this big, complicated tree. Um, but just in the, that in and of itself is going to provide some organization for you. Nine, don't mess with the source code. So remember I showed you how much I love the block button? Um, it's because it gives content authors a little bit of insight without uh, setting them up for disaster. So Spider-Man tells us, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Some of you in this room, like myself, are just dangerous enough. You know a little HTML. You've been to a ladies learning code uh, a seminar, which is great. Like You should learn these things. But if you go in and start messing with the source code, and I'm not even showing you where the button is, right? <laughs> um, but some of you know, if you start going and plugging things in there, the site's not really meant for that. And your development team and your design team have set up the global CSS in a way that has made assumptions and consistency <coughs> expectations. And when you throw those off, you're setting yourself up for content to get messy when the site gets redeveloped. So stay away from the source code button. You can go look, you can peek, okay, um, to see what's going on to educate yourself, but I would really, really hazard against putting anything in there. You disagree? My entire team uses that button all the time. Okay. And we have to put things in because there are some things that our site just doesn't do. Okay. Have you as a team standardized how you're all going in there and playing around? Yes. Then you're fine. You guys have been smart about it, right? You're not just this like one lone ranger at your desk being like Googling things about bootstrap and you're just like chucking them in there. Okay, because people do that, okay? So you guys have a use case where that's fine and you as a team have standardized how you're doing it. That's, that is the exception to the rule. Um, but for those of you who just occasionally peek in there and get really brave, don't. And my last one, which is a cop-out tip, because I finished this last night, um, is don't be afraid. Uh, just step out of your comfort zone and play around with the content authoring interface. You will figure it out. There's lots of resources. Um, there's a, a really great site called Drupalize Me who actually sponsored us. They have some content authoring videos. Um, Drupalize me. See, I speak too fast. Drupalize me. If you come and see me afterwards, I, I have some, some stuff from them that I can help you out with. They are mostly developer, but they do have a few content author uh, videos that can help you go through this. So you can do it. And that's my spiel. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Question. Yes, ma'am. There's a lack of cupcakes at this presentation. Yes, so for those of you who were at my Drupal North presentation, I brought cake, because I'm 